when I was called to this ministry and when I came to Choices in 2017 about on October, so I had to really seek God you know, for Him to really reveal what are His plans for Choices in this season and in this generation. So our goal for them is, is to really bring them back to God, is to really journey with them in their walk with God and to really disciple them to grow into spiritual wholeness. So as I was praying for God, you know, to show me the blueprint of Choices, right? So he showed me that our mission here is to be that bridge that you know, connects them back to God and to a journey of discipleship. And then our vision is that you know, Choices will be a place where they really encounter the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. I entered into a long drought in my spiritual journey. For 25 years, I stopped attending church and did not know any Christian who practiced their faith. I sought love in the wrong place and I constantly feel lonely even though I am not alone. I asked God, if I am born this way, is SSA normal? Why am I unhappy and lonely? I feel that there must be something that I am missing out. God finally answered my questions in a miraculous way. That started my overcoming experience. Soon I discovered that SSA is not of God. I need to surrender this lifestyle and be obedient to God's command. Pastor Tocha invited me to join to Choices and I met other brothers who are in different stages of overcoming from the SSA. I am blessed to be able to share my experience and support other brothers who are still struggling. Most of us are lonely and we desire a community of godly friends outside of our SSA lifestyle. We need Choices to support us to help us break free from temptations and reintroduce us back to God's family. Other than joining the support group, I have a mentor, Josh, and we are meeting regularly twice a month. Josh is able to answer my questions about Christianity and he offers what I have learned from YouTube through the years of sound. He shares with me on leadership skills to prepare me for my journey towards being a mentor myself. In just a few years, God has renewed my life. I am joyful and no longer ashamed of my past, grateful for my life experience as a testimony of God's faithfulness and love. I think the area that has um, benefited both myself and I've learned a lot myself more regularly in is an area of support groups. The, each and every session is so fresh and so rich how the brothers, right, those who struggle with unwanted same-sex attraction, they overcome their temptations, they overcome the lies of the evil one. Right, and you see how God moves in their life each and every week that we meet up. You know, the testimonies that you share to encourage one another to speak into each other's lives. When I was starting out in this ministry, right, a verse that was spoken over me was that harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We really need uh, people who are willing to journey in compassion and humility. As the saying in Choices goes, it doesn't matter if you're a black sheep or a white sheep or even a rainbow sheep, but God's heart is for all His lost sheep. So we really, really want you, if you're listening right now and you're a young person, or even if you're someone who's young at heart, right, contact us and uh, we hope to see you soon. So Choices hope to really build and to expand this team of volunteers, you know, to reach out to more people and strugglers and seekers who need help. We also hope to really reach out to more churches and to really help them to build a similar ministry in their own church. So when God say, you know, to really love people unconditionally, you know, to even love our enemies. So how does it look like? So when we love people, it, it, don't, you know, it doesn't matter that they are different from us and there's no differentiation. So even those who are struggling with same-sex attraction or those who are LGBT, there's no difference. We should love them the same. Good morning, church. Uh, thank you, Pastor Daniel, for inviting me to speak over this weekend. And thank you, Audrey, for your introduction just now. I'm very privileged today to be addressing this church on the subject of 
a church for those in the LGBT community who seek to walk with God. My name is Tao Chen. To put pictures to the introduction that Audrey gave me just now, I am an assistant pastor at 316 Church here in Singapore. I'm also a Bible school instructor, and I've taught in schools in Singapore, Malaysia, India, and Vietnam. I also serve in several ministries, including in the ministry of True Love Is under 316 Church, and also here at Choices uh, at Church of Our Saviour under the leadership of Roy Yee. In addition, I lead my own independent weekly Bible studies. I'm also a guest preacher. The photo on the left here is me speaking at a Christmas celebration event in India before COVID. Prior to serving in ministry, I worked in the marketplace for 25 years, mostly as a banker. And I've been surprised in the services here over the last, over this weekend, that I've been meeting my various colleagues or different acquaintances from my banking world of the past 25 years. I serve in ministry now, but that is a far cry from my lifestyle just seven years ago when I was still addicted to gay sex and gay porn. You see, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, for those of you who are Star Wars fans, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior when I was a teenager. But even before that, from as early as when I was seven years old, I knew that I was attracted to the same sex. I was not a victim of childhood trauma or of aberrant sexual advances, but neither was I given a multiple choice questionnaire at any time to choose whether I wish to be attracted to the same sex or to the opposite sex. I just knew that I was attracted to the same sex. This attraction to the same sex did not stop even after I received Jesus. On the contrary, when I stopped walking with God in my early 20s, I plunged into the darkness of a full-on gay lifestyle, and I became addicted to gay sex and gay porn. Many times, I even had sex with three or four different guys in the same night because there was pleasure in each encounter. Over time, the grip of this pleasure had such a place in my life that I could not break free, even if I wanted to. But after every encounter, and irrespective of however many encounters I had, irrespective of however high, many highs I chased, I would always end up empty, unfulfilled, unsatisfied. The Bible calls this the passing or temporary pleasure of sin. Until one day in 2014, a friend of mine told me that he was going to church that Sunday. I said to my friend that I was too dirty to go to church, but what he said next to me shocked me. He said, no, I'm not. I'm righteous before God. It was so strange to hear this that I followed my friend to church out of sheer curiosity to find out whether this was so or not. At church, for the first time in nearly 30 years, I found myself hooked, this time to the Word of God that was being preached there, just as the Bible says in Psalms 42, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul, O God, for you. I kept returning to this church again and again, hooked to the Word of God, but at the same time, I was also still rushing right after service to the gay sauna for the rest of the Sunday, hooked to gay sex. It was surreal, and I did not know what to make of this. Then one day, the pastor preached on the parable of the prodigal son, and he said this, when the son was still far away, the father ran to the son, not the other way around. And when the father got to the son, the father fell on the neck of the son, kissed him, and put the best robe on the son. And then the pastor preached this. He said, do you realize that the son was still filthy at this time, having just returned from feeding swine, penniless, homeless, and yet the father kissed him, put the best robe on him when he was still filthy, not after he cleaned himself up first. It was as if God was saying to me, 
I know where you are, son. Come home just as you are. That love of God for me broke my heart and brought me to tears for years to come every time I recount that encounter. As I started to walk with God again from that moment on, I sought God for answers on this same sex attraction that I experienced. Why me? Is this of God? What am I supposed to do with this? And I discovered that God indeed had answers for me, even truth that would set me free. And they were all in the Bible. So I started devouring the Word of God for answers. And as I worked through and as I walked out these answers for myself, on the 6th of June, 2018, I finally broke free from the grip of same-sex attraction that had kept me under bondage for nearly 30 years, not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. Praise God. So church, if God will do that for me, He will do the same for everyone and anyone else here as well who desires it and who seeks Him in faith and with patience, for there's no partiality with God. Your struggle may not be the same as mine, but whatever your struggle is, be it with porn, sex, lust, gambling, smoking, drugs, alcohol, and so on, God can set you free if you choose it. Now, the journey may not be easy and it may not be short, but there are answers in His Word, and by the power of His Spirit, you too can experience the same freedom that so many of us have tasted and testified that it is good. So, Father, I pray over this church right now for those who may be experiencing weights, habits that have held them down for years and who have been trying to deal with this to break free from them, I pray, Father, that you set in each and every one of them, Father, a heart of great conviction right now, a heart that says to you, Father, I mean business with you. I want you right now to help me set free from these things that have weighed me down. I pray, Father, that you build into them, you work into them that conviction of coming to you, Father, for help. Father, your word says, run to the throne of grace for mercy and for grace to help in time of need. Mercy because we've gotten it wrong before. Grace to help so that we may be set free from these things that have besieged us before. Father, I pray that you've also built into each and every one of them that you are speaking to right now. The courage to come out to their church leaders and their church pastors so that they may receive the help that you have set for them in this body of Christ that you have personally set them in. And we ask, Father, for wisdom and revelation on these leaders and pastors so that they may walk through the journey of overcoming with these, pe- with these who come up to them. And we ask, Father, for great anointing over this church as this church seeks to minister to those who are wanting to be set free from the things that they've held them down before. We ask for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, to be clear, experiencing the power of God that has set me free from the grip of same-sex attraction does not mean that I no longer experience attraction to the same sex. No. I still experience attraction to the same sex, but it does mean that I'm no longer now unable to overcome those temptations. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that this is the same type of victory that even Jesus experienced when he was here on earth. For Jesus too was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Why? Because he was able to overcome all such temptations. At that time, in my own journey to overcoming, it was a lonely journey because not many churches were as aware nor as well equipped to address the LGBT space then. Thank God today, many more churches are getting better equipped to address this space as you are doing today. And I thank God that people like me then have churches like you now 
to come out and to come home to, as your poster outside declares. Now today, I want to dig deeper on who we are inviting to come out and come home. And what does that mean for you as a church? What does that look like for you as a church for those in the LGBT community who seek to walk with God? Firstly, who are we inviting to come out and come home? You see, the LGBT community is not one ubiquitous community. There are four very different constituents to this community. The overcomers, which is the top right-hand quadrant of this chart, are Christians like me, who experience same-sex attraction, who have sought God, and who have experienced the power of God to overcome those LGBT desires. But then there are also strugglers, Christians who experience same-sex attraction, they're asking the question and they're seeking God on answers for their questions to same-sex attraction. They're still working out those answers and they're still walking out their own journey to overcoming. Now, the two quadrants on the right, the overcomers and the strugglers, we are the minority. By far, the vast majority of the LGBT community are the moderates, the bottom left-hand quadrant of your chart. These are those who experience same-sex attraction, they're in the lifestyle, and they want to stay in the lifestyle. Some may even be Christians, and some may even be in church. Some may even be walking with God in other areas of their life, but not this one. They are by far the vast majority of the LGBT community. Many times, they are not interested in God's narrative of what it means to be a Christian who experiences same-sex attraction. But some of them may still be in church. And then there are the activists on the top left-hand quadrant who are fiercely promoting and celebrating the LGBT lifestyle. These activists have become have been very extensive in their influence over media and entertainment, and they're increasingly more influential even in education and legislation too in Singapore. These activists are a small minority, but because they're so vocal, they're so fierce, they're domineering the social media space, discipling particularly our youth and young adults, and now discipling our society even on the LGBT narrative that they are promoting. As a result, it would be a mistake to assume that the entire LGBT community is all the same. And therefore, it would be a gross mistake for us to respond to the entire LGBT community the same way. It is especially a mistake for us to respond to overcomers, strugglers and moderates as if they were activists, because they are not activists. The vast majority of the LGBT community are not activists, and we would do ourselves a great disfavor to assume that they all are and address them the same way. I lived for almost 30 years as a moderate, the bottom left-hand quadrant. I lived for almost two and a half years as a struggler, the bottom right-hand quadrant, and now I live as an overcomer, the top right-hand quadrant, so I do speak from experience in this space. So how then should we respond? Well, we need to match our response to the constituent that we are addressing. With the overcomers, we should celebrate their testimony and exhort them to serve. But with the strugglers, we should welcome them and journey with them. With the moderates, we should accept them into our community and take time to understand them. But with the activists, we should learn to understand them, but to stand with God on points of difference. So in our appeal to come out and come home to God and to church, we are addressing the overcomers, the strugglers, and yes, even the moderates, but not the activists, not because we don't love them, but because they're unlikely to be in church and because they are not 
interested. Now, what then do we do when such overcomers, strugglers and moderates actually respond to our call for them to come out and come home to God and to church in our midst? What does a church for those in the LGBT community who seek to walk with God look like? Well, one set of answers is in CATS. CATS, C-A-T-S, which stands for Companionship, Answers, Testimony, and Supplication. Firstly, companionship. This means being a trusted friend to such overcomers, strugglers, and even moderates who choose to come out and come home to God and to church. And this includes accepting such overcomers, strugglers, and moderates as they are, instead of rejecting them. That means taking the time, even over the long haul of years, to understand them, to build trust and credibility with them, and to do life together with them as a community, just as we would with anyone else, without any agenda to maneuver them into another way of life if and when they are not interested. I know the word accept can sound very uncomfortable in the LGBT space, so let me clarify. Acceptance does not mean agreeing with, affirming, or celebrating a choice of lifestyle that is contrary to God's design, no. But it does mean not rejecting even those who choose that lifestyle at this time. Isn't that how a church would respond to any non-believer who walks through our doors anyway? Salvation is a choice, just as any lifestyle is a choice. And yet we don't reject non-believers, nor do we manipulate them into receiving Jesus, do we? Instead, we model out for them what abundant life looks like. We model out for them what the goodness of God looks like. And we don't give up on them, even over the long haul, do we? Well, why then would it be any different on how we respond to those who experience same-sex attraction? Well, if so, what then does this acceptance in companionship look like in practice? Perhaps these three handles will help. Firstly, it means cultivating a culture of community that does life together, irrespective of where someone is in their walk with God. A culture of community that does life together is one that includes rather than excludes in our regular community those who experience same-sex attraction, where there is no culture of holy huddle that excludes those who experience same-sex attraction and where those who experience same-sex attraction are not quarantined in some dedicated group so that they are specially monitored to a higher degree there and so that they don't affect the rest of the church from there and so on and so on. No. Doing life together includes doing church or ministry together. This is a picture of one of our support group meetings at Choices. Doing life together includes having fun together as a regular church community, even in our own homes. This is a picture of us playing board games together in one of our homes. Doing life together includes going out together in public as a regular church community for food, for birthday celebrations, for movies, and so on. In addition, a culture of community is one that goes the distance together, even if things are not spot on all the time for some of us in some parts of our walk with God. Now, don't get me wrong. Our heart is for all to walk with God in every part of their life all the time. That's our heart. But if some are not walking with God in some areas of their life, instead of keeping them at arm's length, instead of abandoning them, instead of threatening them, Let's resolve to do life together with them as a community, valuing them, looking out for them, and being there for them just as any friend would. At my church, 
a slightly higher percentage of our regular attendees experience same-sex attraction than the national average, which is unsurprising given our ministry in True Love is. But because of our regular culture of community, many of those who experience same-sex attraction in our midst have developed the confidence to not just let us, but God into their lives, even into this part of their lives, and are therefore now walking with God and even serving God, and we praise God for that. Such is the impact of community. For the Bible says two are better than one. A threefold cord is not easily broken. Secondly, this acceptance in companionship is not just about talking the talk. It is also about walking the talk in modeling out that for strugglers and moderates in particular, there is truly no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. In 2021, last year, I was surprised when my senior pastor at 316 Church asked me to preach at the main service in one of the regular sermon series then. After that, my senior pastor surprised me even more, this time asking me to serve as an assistant pastor. I was delighted to, but I remember asking my senior pastor then whether the 316 church as a whole would accept me as an assistant pastor given my background. And without hesitation, he said, yes, of course. This is walking the talk at one of the highest level, and I'm not alone. Joseph, who is another overcomer who has testified on True Lovers before, is also at 316, and he serves as worship leader for the main service as well as a youth leader. Philip, whom you saw on the video clip earlier, is also at 316 Church, and he serves in the welcome team, and he now serves increasingly at Choices too. I've personally known Philip for 17 years when we were both very actively in the gay lifestyle. After I was set free from the grip of same-sex attraction, I hesitated to contact Philip because I had deleted his phone number from my phone. And I didn't want to reach out to him on Facebook because I didn't want to see his pictures on Facebook. But during COVID-19, I had an impression from God that I should reach out to him. And reluctantly, I did. When I did so, I was surprised to find out that he too had broken free from the grip of same-sex attraction in his own personal journey with God. I rejoiced with him, but he was desperately lonely. So I brought him to church where Philip was immediately open about his background and his past. Thank God, the church leaders, pastors, and the regular community at church not just accepted him in word, but they also accepted him in deed. Our pastor would often post pictures of Philip serving during his sermons. And Philip was even our service poster boy many times over. Yet, Philip was still hesitant initially to testify publicly about the power of God that he personally experienced that set him free because as a freelance personal trainer, his economic livelihood was on the line if he got cancelled for standing up for God. But as our church continued to do life together with him, and as he continued to walk with God himself, today he has developed the confidence and the courage to stand for God publicly, as you saw in the video clip earlier, even though this may cost him. We rejoice at the courage of God that Philip has developed in the support of his church community. We also rejoice how this experience of church community has continued to encourage him in his own walk with God, where our senior pastor has just celebrated with Philip his third year anniversary of walking free in sexual purity, including even from masturbation. We praise God for what great work he has done in Philip through our regular church community. These are living examples of how important it is to walk the talk and not just talk the talk, that it is safe to come out and to come home to church. 
By contrast, I've heard of even pastors at other churches who do not come out to their own church because they do not want to deal with the risk of being judged or marginalized by their own church if they were to do so. I encourage us not to follow those examples, for how then would we expect to set the example for others to come out and to come home to God and to church in our midst? Now, in this acceptance of companionship, that does not mean there is no discipleship or correction. No. There is a time and place for correction. But first, let's make sure that we discern that time and place accurately by the Spirit. Then Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. But such discipleship and correction should be to restore and not to drive away. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So we must be careful to disciple and to correct with those intentions and not otherwise. So in summary, I would encourage church leaders to consider these three handles in understanding what companionship looks like. And that is C for companionship in the acronym CATS. A is for answers, meaning to be equipped with God's answers, including empirical evidence of research and science, but also scriptural truths that expose the twisted narrative of the world that traps those who experience same-sex attraction and that is discipling our youth and young adults of today. For example, the world says, if you love me, you will celebrate me. No. The Bible's answer is this. Depends on what we're celebrating. For 1 Corinthians chapter 13 defines love as not rejoicing in iniquity, but rejoicing in the truth. So no. The Bible love does not say we must celebrate you in all things in order to love you. Another example is this. The world's narrative of today says you are what you feel. If you feel like a boy one day, you are a boy. If you feel like a girl one day, you are a girl. You are what you feel. No. The Bible's answer is this. We may not be able to help how we feel, just as I was never given a multiple choice questionnaire on whether I wanted to be attracted to the same sex or to the opposite sex. We may not be able to help how we feel, but we can help what we do with how we feel. You see, we have a choice. We can choose to align ourselves with God's ways for us despite what we feel, and experience the fullness of his abundant life as a victor over how we feel. Instead of aligning ourselves with how we feel and struggle in confusion and victimhood as a result. For the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that God has made a way of escape. So there is a choice and there is a better choice for God has provided us a better choice. These are some of the answers that the Bible has for us on how to deal with the experience of same-sex attraction, but also on how to deal with the narrative of the world today that the LGBT activists have promoted so much. Speaking of answers, our Ministry Choices has arranged a series of programs addressing the LGBT space. Starting on Friday the 27th of May, which is just two weeks away, there is a live encounter worship night here for overcomers and strugglers. We're conducting that in room 308 above us. So for those who are overcomers and strugglers and others in the LGBT space, do join us to seek and worship God together on this live encounter worship night. Later, on Friday the 8th and 15th of July on Zoom, we are running a program called God's Heart for the LGBT Community 
to equip those who want to journey with those who experience same-sex attraction. Then on Thursday, the 18th of, and the 25th of August, again on Zoom, we're equipping parents on how to converse with their children on LGBT matters. Lastly, I'm teaching three sessions, also on Zoom, on Thursday the 1st, the 8th, and the 15th of September, on Bible answers to living out and fulfilling God's purpose as a Christian who experiences same-sex attraction. I'll be dealing with answers to the contemporary narrative of today's world, such as the examples that we've just examined just now, but in a lot more detail. So do join us for these equipping sessions. I do realize that some here are parents of children who experience same-sex attraction. Some have come up to us over the last two services where I've preached. I understand where you are. And I've met many parents who are devastated. There is hope and a future, both for you and for your children. There are answers that God has for you as well as for your children. But don't rush to assume and to presume. Start first by understanding God's heart for this community. Start first by understanding God's answers. So do come to our Choices Ministry to get equipped on these things so that you're in a better place to minister to your children. I understand where you are. There are answers, but please don't rush. You see, even with all these answers that we're getting equipped on, I would encourage us not to be quick to force our answers on all and sundry all the time. I've met Christians who are so eager to fix other people that they rush to help with their answers, even before they've taken the time to understand the individual, even before they've worked on building trust and credibility with the individual, even before they've ministered friendship or done life together with the individual. Not every person who experiences same-sex attraction is looking for answers all the time. And not every person who experiences same-sex attraction wants us to speak into their lives all the time. Some just want to be heard and understood for now. So let's learn from James here in this passage to be swift to hear, slow to speak. You see, when I was still intent on staying in a gay lifestyle for nearly 30 years, pointing out to me then that I was living in sin, whilst true, would not have cut it for me. But as you heard, it was the embrace of God, even in the midst of my sin, that broke my heart for God as He invited me to come out and to come home to Him just as I was. Today, you too can be that same arm of God that embraces someone else like me who needs it. So church, let's not be quick to set out to fix other people. Instead, let's make the effort first to understand them, to welcome and accept them into our community the same way that Jesus ate with Pharisees and tax collectors and sinners, the same way that the father of the prodigal son kissed the son and put the best rope on him when he was still filthy. And then, let's model out the goodness of God that leads men to repentance, so that they would then desire to seek the answers that we have for them from God. Just as I sought answers after I was inspired to walk with God. A for answers. T is for testimony. There is great power in testimony, as this passage in Revelations points out. For we overcome even the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And thank God today we have many named, identified, testimony after testimony of overcomers that point to the reality and the joy of overcoming by the power of His Holy Spirit. So let's not be ashamed to raise awareness of these testimonies. However, here, 
we must, not, we must also not abuse these testimonies to pressurize moderates who are not interested at this time or to pressurize strugglers who are still working things out because the LGBT activists have accused some pastors and leaders and some parents of weaponizing these testimonies and using these testimonies to confront those they minister to or even their own kids with, if they can do it, why can't you? What's wrong with you? What's your problem? No, that's not what these testimonies are for. Neither is that what these testimonies are about. These testimonies are to inspire, not condemn. They are to encourage, not discourage. They are to lift others to seek God, not to turn them away from God. T for testimonies. And lastly, S for supplication or prayer. The single most important key for any moderate or any struggler is whether they want to let God into even this part of their life or not. If they don't let God in, God cannot help them. And one way we can help here is to pray for them. Paul shows us a very powerful prayer in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that I would pray privately for strugglers whom I minister to, and it's this. Pray that God will give them a gift of repentance so that they may know the truth, so that they may come to their senses, so that they may escape from the snares of the devil. My maid, who is a believer in the center of this photo here, prayed for me privately without me knowing for four and a half years, even when I was bringing different guys home every night for sex. The more she prayed for me, the more guys I brought home. Yet, thank God, she did not give up. Her persistent and fervent prayers made a way for God to send my friend to me who told me he was going to church that Sunday and made a way for me to respond to God after that. Today, church, we have the privilege of my maid joining us for service this morning. So, Rosalie, if you would stand up, let us all appreciate what my maid has done for me as she served God. Thank you. So I encourage all of us not to dismiss or to despise the power of even lonesome prayer. CATS, C-A-T-S, for companionship, answers, testimony, and supplication. But whenever I raise these testimonies that I pointed to earlier that testify of the reality of God's alternative narrative, and the reality of God's alternative lifestyle choice. And whenever I advocate for the way of ministry that I've been preaching on so far today, the LGBT activists out there shift into overdrive, particularly on social media, to cancel, to malign, to silence, discriminate, and to exclude those who testify and the ministries and the churches that choose to stand with God in this space. To those who testify their ministries and their churches, this is how the LGBT activists and those that they influence respond on social media. They ridicule us as clowns, hateful, evil, closed-minded, homophobes, something they would vomit over and pee over and so on. Those are all there in these comments here. This is in spite of the reality that our testimonies have helped and brought hope to so many. Here are some direct messages from those who have been inspired by the touch of God in our testimonies. Message 19 on the left here says this, I had dealt with same-sex attraction my entire life. I thought and was taught that it was impossible for a Christian to have same-sex attraction. So I spent my entire life thinking I was cursed and that something was wrong with me. I didn't know that there were any other Christians like me. That all changed in 2019 when I came across your ministry on Facebook. For the first time, I felt understood instead of alone. And I was finally able to begin healing. 
My point is this, for all the poison that the LGBT activists out there throw at us, ministering God's alternative choice, the way we've been examining today, is not, as the activists allege, socially unjust, intolerant, uninclusive, bigoted, judgmental, or archaic. On the other hand, what these LGBT activists out there are doing in cancelling any and all such alternative choice is socially unjust, intolerant, uninclusive, bigoted, judgmental, and archaic. These LGBT activists in cancelling any and all choice, including God's alternative choice, are advocating tyranny, where they are the tyrant. So church, know that you and your ministry at Choices, you as a church that desires to be one that serves the LGBT community who seeks to walk with God, you are on the right side of history. You are on the right side of God's history. But when we do so, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4 that the world will think it's strange that we do not follow them in the tide of affirming and celebrating these lifestyles. And they will even speak evil of us as they've been doing in the comments that I showed you earlier. Hebrews tells us that they may even humiliate us and humiliate those who associate with us. And this may even cost us economically. But Hebrews goes on to tell us, know this, our reward by God will be great. So I close with this as your worship team comes up to get ready to close. I thank God for your senior pastor here and for your church leadership that have stood up for your ministry choices despite the social costs and despite the pressure of the LGBT activists. I'm inspired by their resoluteness in standing with God. I want you to know the heart of your senior pastor here in doing what is right in the eyes of God in the LGBT space, his heart for the LGBT community who want to come out and come home to church, his heart to serve them, those who want to walk with God, despite the cost to this church by the LGBT activists. And I want you to watch this clip and appreciate what an awesome job your senior pastor is doing. Let's play this clip. So. I think sometimes it is important to get the voice out so that those folks who are caught in between can know that they actually have a choice. That there are people who represent different points of view as to how you go about um, dealing with this same-sex attraction right? without saying that this is the only way. When we look at people who are struggling with same-sex attraction, they are more than just a number, they are just more than pawns in some sort of propaganda battle, you know. They are actually valuable people. And really, this is the other thing, I suppose. I can see myself in them. Right? So there's no reason for me to treat the people with same-sex affection any differently than I would treat someone who just walked in and you know, wanted to know the love of God. Pastor, I'm really grateful to your, um, to your ministry. Um, because where else are we going to find help? If it wasn't for the bold, boldness of um, churches like yours and uh, ministries like Choices and others, 316, True Love is, if it wasn't for their boldness, where else would we find help? Those of us who are searching for God in this, in this struggle. You know, Tochen, I would not dare to claim any kind of credit in our church, any credit for this. We have done, we have not done anything that we have not have done for your own brother and your own sister. And I do feel that as we work our way through this, we are wanting a more authentic Christianity. 
So church, let us appreciate your senior pastor and the leadership that surrounds him. So church, I applaud you as you continue to stand where God stands and as you continue to declare, just like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. For you will not be shortchanged as your kingdom fruit and therefore your reward at the Bema seat of Christ will be great as you stand where God stands. God bless you all. We will close in the following way. Very shortly, I will pray as the background music plays as well. And after I pray, uh, we will sing one last concluding song, which is a rallying call uh, consistent with the message that I've been preaching this morning. And then Audrey will come out and close us in a final prayer, all right? So let us pray. Father, we thank you for all the words that you've sown into our hearts today. We thank you, Father, for this church in the midst of our nation, Singapore, that have stood up for what is right in your eyes, that have chosen to minister in this space despite the cost, that have chosen, Father, to be the safe place for those who seek you to come out and to come home. We ask, Father, for great anointing and protection over this church as they continue to walk with you and serve you in this space. We ask for great favor. And we ask also, Father, for great kingdom fruit as they bless those in the LGBT community who wants to walk with you. And we ask, Father, that you continue to draw many multitudes in this nation and even our nations around us to come out and to come home to their church, to their leaders, to their pastors and come here also for ministry. And we pray, Father, that you continue to supply choices with your anointing, your, your flow of volunteers, your flow of uh, overcomers, your flow of testifiers, those who would testify of your power to transform, to breathe new life, to set free. And we ask, Father, that you build into this church, you speak into this church, the same heart that you have for the LGBT community. What breaks your heart? Show that to us so that it breaks our heart too. What rejoices your heart? Show that to us so that that rejoices our heart too. And we ask, Father, for revival in this church, revival to stand even taller for you in this space, revival to minister even stronger for you in this space. And we ask, Father, as the church does so, you bless this church greatly in kingdom fruit and in kingdom outcome. We ask for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let's rise and respond together.
as we have sung Hosanna. This is from the Hebrew Hoshiana. It's a plea, a cry for God to save us. Today, there may be some of us crying out to God for help to be free of sin or any impediment that keeps us from having a deeper relationship with God. Whether it's gender identity, addictions of any kind, or any other lifestyle habits, be assured, church, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Now that we have heard God's word through Pastor Tao Chen, let faith arise in our hearts. There is a way out. So let's allow God, our shepherd, to lead us and our loved ones. Let us pray. Dear Lord, only you know the state of our hearts, all that we struggle with in secret. Yet despite of our secret shame, you still look out for us. You run to us when we merely turn our gaze to you. You embrace us while we are covered in filth and you forgive us when we repent. Lord, we repent. We give you the burdens of our heart. Wash us clean and quench us with your living water. Whether we are overcomers, strugglers, or family members of such, be our El Shaddai, God, our sufficiency. We cry out, Christ is enough for me. Psalm 73, verse 25 to 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We surrender our body, mind, and spirit to you. From this day forward, set us free. Give us your strength to persevere and overcome temptations. Give us grace to walk single-mindedly in your truth and your holiness. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down and we overcome him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of our testimony. Thank you, Lord for the powerful testimony and ministry of choices, true love is, and Pastor Tao Chen. Strengthen and encourage and protect them and their families in all areas of life. In the name of Jesus. Now church, receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you shalom. In Jesus' name, amen.